it was different back in those days. The racing ethics were different. And I think that's another reason I'm so opinionated because when I hear people complain right now, today, I look at them, I'm like, <laughs> you wouldn't have made it in our day. Hello and welcome to episode 13 of Mics Are Hot from Racing America. I am Alanis King and alongside me is Monica Palumbo. Hello. Thank y'all so much for tuning in. It's so good to see you again. Yeah, it is. We have so much to talk about, I feel like, today. I mean, and we're only, what, I, I guess we were, we're seven races in at this point and there's already drama and, and tempers are flaring and craziness happening. There is so much drama and so much going on. And this is what I love about NASCAR because you tune into a NASCAR race and something is always happening. Yeah. And, you, and I'm sure people probably think, oh, you know, the drama is going to happen once the playoffs hit. But no, we're, st we're still very early in the <laughs> season and it is already happening, which I, I kind of enjoy. Just like it is already happening, my cat Portia is smacking her head against my computer. And you see me over here with my hand just trying to maneuver her. You're like, Portia, stop. Portia, <laughs> let's do this a little later. But today we are very, very, very excited to have our good friend, Kenny Wallace, on the show. The theme of today's show is media influencers. And who better to talk about that than the man who is online all the time. He really doesn't have a filter. And you got that right, Alanis. Like he literally is online all the time. I think he even did a hit Easter night at 10 PM. <laughs> um, you know, just the man, we're going to talk to him here in a little bit, but when you talk about, you know, pushing people's buttons and saying whatever he wants, he is the man at that. I'm so excited to catch up with him. Oh my goodness. But before we talk to Kenny and hear his perspective on everything, because we will hear everything, we should first talk about Richmond and maybe Coda. Monica, you were at Richmond. What yeah. did you think? Oh my gosh. It's like opening up a bag of worms. I feel <laughs> like it was the cup race it was so interesting. Um, there's been a lot of negative feedback from it. I think it was a strategic race. Um, I feel that NASCAR did its best on getting the race in with, you know, the rain tires and all of that. And then of course it went into overtime and we had that late race caution. And then we're going to dive into it here in a little bit. Um, but yeah, and even coming from Coda, you had your first ever spotting job there. I did. What, what was your takeaway? How was that experience? Like you so seem like you fully embraced it. I did. I had so much fun. And, you know, I practiced for hours before I showed up at Coda because as a spotter, I'm sure a lot of people listening know what a spotter does is tell a driver what is around them, in front of them, and behind them. So you need to tell them how close the car behind them is, what's going on next to them, if there's a wreck in front of them. You need to help them understand what's going on on the racetrack, things they may not be able to see. So we did a lot of prep work for this, studied for hours, synced up the audio from Tyler Reddick's 2023 Coda Radio with the broadcast because Tyler was obviously the most shown because he dominated the race and won. And we learned what to call and what not to call and things like mm. that. And then you get up on the spotter stand and practice and qualifying is actually really intense because in qualifying, the very important thing is to give your driver a gap out front and a gap behind because your driver does not want to get stuck behind someone else or have someone behind them bugging them during qualifying. So it's basically all three of the spotters. We had three spotters at Coda. All three of the spotters have to converse with each other about where the opening is for the driver to get out and qualify. So you get up there for practice and qualifying your first attempt at spotting. And it's really, really nerve wracking because yeah. our car, Brad Perez, he was not locked into the race. He did not have the owner points to be locked into the race. So if we messed it up and we got him the wrong gap, he was not going to make the race. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure. It was so much pressure. And then you get done with that and you're like, okay, we made the race. We qualified 31st. We're good. We're and then in. you get up there the next day. Yeah. Then you get up there the next day. And you see the field coming two by two at you and you see them and they're like more than half a mile away and you have to find your car and all you can see is the noses of the cars. So you're looking for blue and orange with white speckles 
and you're like, and I didn't have binoculars, so just oh, use my you did. <laughs> no, and I should have had binoculars, but I actually had to. My eyes have gotten worse since I last got contacts, so I had to use an unused pair of my husband's contacts, which are oh. like ultra HD for me because they're like too much of the right prescription. <laughs> but I needed them to see that far, and so they're coming. And you, you lean forward like a foot and you're like, this doesn't actually help, but it makes me feel better. And you're like, what am I doing up here? Why am I up here? What's going on? What? How did I get here? How did I get here? What? This was a little much. <laughs> and then you're like, okay, one to go. Green flag. And you're like, green flag. I have 60 seconds and they're going to be in my zone. And I have to like call the cars next to him and tell him what's going on. And you have no depth perception where I was. I was in the yeah. stadium section. So turn 12 through like 16, I was in the grandstands. And when they come down the long, long back straightaway toward turn 12, you have no depth perception. And my driver, Brad Perez told me that would be the case. So he said, just tell me when the cars next to me are out of line, because if okay. a car is out of the racing line, that means they may try to dive on you. So you have no depth perception. So you're just like out of line to your left, out of line to your left. Ah, that, wow. ah, ah, they're coming for you. They're coming for you. Inside, 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 left side. <laughs> were there other spotters where you were sitting? Yes. So, um, there is a dedicated spotters area there, and I stood with my teammates. So uh, at Alpha Prime Racing, Ryan Pistana, he does their graphic design and stuff, mm -hmm. and then he spots on road courses when they need an extra spotter. So me and Ryan were together, and then a couple of grandstands over were the like licensed spotters, and we just kind of made our own little area and stood next to each other so we wouldn't be stressed. Um, yeah. and Ryan really helped me like make sure I knew what buttons to press and things like that. But it was really difficult because as Brad goes through the turns, he wants you to call left and right, but mm -hmm. left and right changes depending on where he's facing. So one angle, they're on the left. The other angle, another car is on the right. And like, you have to call it correctly based on his right and his left, not your right oh, and your my left. Goodness. And it switches throughout the entire section. You also, there was at one point, he had a car next to him on his left. And I'm like, left side, still there, door, door, spinner to your right, eight cars spinning, you're clear of the eight, still on your door. And like, you have to be very, very calm. You can't be like, ah, the eight is spinning. Don't right. hit the eight. <laughs> like, right. Well, how, so all in all, how do you think you did when the race was over and you could finally put your, you know, your cans down mm -hmm. where you're like, okay, phew, I did a decent job for my first experience or how do you think you did? I think I did well. I really enjoyed it. I listened back to the radio. Um, there were a couple of instances where you actually have a delay when you're pressing the button to when the transmission starts. So there were a couple of instances where like something had happened really quickly and like part of my word got cut off because I started mm. talking fast. Um, so there were a couple of instances like that. But other than that, I thought it went really well. I warned Brad of things that were like in his section, like there's speedy drive through the racing line, hits the apex, goes out wide in turn 12. Brad also wanted me to use his meme corner names instead of the turn numbers. So turn 12, oh which is the really sharp, yeah, the really sharp left-hander is the big boss battle turn. Oh and then my the goodness. little- <laughs> and then the little squigglies after that are the Disney World line because you know when you're in line at an amusement park, I'd be you like, turn, around like turn, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> you're, uh, you're a big boss. I mean, how do you how do you even keep up with that? <laughs> and then there was he also wanted me to use the DRS straightaway. So in Formula One, if you're listening and you're unfamiliar with Formula One, they have the drag reduction system. You activate the drag reduction system, it actually makes your car faster down a long straightaway. So into turn 12, there's a long straightaway. Brad wanted me to call that the DRS straightaway. So I also had to call the DRS straightaway. So I called every single meme corner name. I stayed very, very calm. And we even made some wow. jokes on the radio. Like part of the way through the race, we made some jokes. We were having fun. And it was just... It worked really well. And I got a text a couple of days after the race from the team, team owner at Alpha Prime Racing, which Brad was driving for, Tommy Joe Martins. And he mm -hmm. said we may bring y'all to Portland. <laughs> and I said, Yay! that means I did well. <laughs> yeah. That is awesome. It was now, really exciting. <laughs> a question that I'm really concerned with, because, you know, 
food is priority for me. Um, <laughs> what about snacks? Like, did you have your cooler of snacks? Okay, no. And I also never drank any water. So like my mouth was really dry. Oh, I was, okay. Okay, Monica, I love water and I drink like multiple <laughs> gallons of water a day. But with the spotting microphone, your microphone, you may not notice this when you're watching the race, the spotters have their microphone in their lips yeah. right here. Because if there's any gap between your lips and the microphone, there's going to get wind in there. Mm -hmm. So I was like, what if I move the microphone and the little stem breaks? I don't want the stem to break or the stem gets loose and I can't put it back on my lips. Like I can't drink any water. Also, like if I drink water and I take too long to drink water and Brad comes back around because you're listening to the pacing. So our first spotter was Tommy Joe Martins, the team owner. The second spotter was my husband and the third spotter was me. You don't really know where you're going to pick up the driver. Now you yeah. can use channel two. So channel one has the driver on it. Channel two does not. So when you need to talk about logistics and not involve the driver, you switch to channel two. Now we could have switched to channel two and like said, entering your section, we could have done that, but we just didn't this race. So once he enters my husband's section, I have to just kind of listen to the rhythm and know that he's about to enter mine. Ah, Ooh. gotcha. And I, I will give a huge shout out to Brandon Jones in his bright yellow, bright, bright yellow Menards car, because Brandon Jones was around Brad the entire race. You and miss what him. I did Exactly. So what you do is you have timing and scoring up on your phone. And like, so I have like team timing and scoring and you highlight Brad in a certain color. So I highlighted Brad in pink and I saw where Brandon Jones was in front of him. Like Brandon Jones is 10 cars in front of Brad. He's six cars in front of Brad. I would see Brandon come and I would go and then one, you knew. two, three. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I was oh, there's Brad. Okay. Now we're I good. All I right. got it. I got it. We finished top 20. We finished 18th. It was Brad's Whoa! best ever Xfinity finish. It Yay! was so exciting. And I'm telling you, we went to his sponsor, Sendero. They had this um, event after the race where they had tacos and beer and stuff like that. And we went to this Yummy. party and also free merch. We went to this like little taco party and it felt like we won. We were hooting. <laughs> we were hollering. We were like, yeah, we did it. We did it. I love I'm it. telling you. Like so many people don't see the behind the scenes of a small team and like what it means when you finish in a certain position. We spent that whole night just hollering at each other like 18th, 18th, 18th. Yeah. I'm telling you, we, it was like a winner's party. It was amazing. I we had the best that. time. It was so neat <laughs> even to see Jordan Anderson racing in the Xfinity series this weekend in Richmond with Parker. Pull. Raslav on the pole. Like it was they were so pumped. And I've actually been talking about Parker for probably the last two Me years too. now. Keep your mm -hmm. eye on this guy. And mm -hmm. he, you know, he's this, this quiet soul and, but a great driver and look at him, you know, he finally mm -hmm. got in the spotlight some this weekend. I was so excited for them over there. Well, it's really interesting about Parker Retzloff is Parker Retzloff is one of those people who came up through iRacing, Right. My husband was actually oh, in an yeah. iRacing league with Parker. And my husband always says, I have never been in an iRacing league where the differential in speed and talent was as big between first and second. Parker Retzloff never lost a race. He was completely in a different wow. league. He, and like my husband is very good at iRacing. If you're familiar with iRacing, his i rating is 6,200, which is really good. Like the top i racers are like 10,000s and he's at a 6200. Yeah. He's very very good. Parker was waxing him, destroying him. And so for a, just like Monica for years, we have been watching Parker because that's a good driver right there. Yeah. And he got on pole in the Xfinity series with a small team like Jordan Anderson Racing. Like that's we were exciting. celebrating 18th. Imagine what they were celebrating for oh, the pole. No. <laughs> Well, no, thanks for sharing your story. I was following thanks you via asking. social media. I was like, this girl's having a blast. But I know it was, you know, a lot of hard work scary. that goes into it as well. Yeah, so. it was really scary. And, you know, I wrote a whole story about it for ESPN. The story talks about the logistics of NASCAR and budgets and stuff like that. I also did kind of a day in the life video on YouTube where I showed what it's like to be on a NASCAR team for a weekend. So if you're interested in that, you can see both of them. They're online. Thank you for asking, Monica. Yeah. Now go to Richmond because you were oh, there yeah. and Richmond was 
interesting. It was very interesting. The crazy thing is, too, is all week I looked at the weather. It was supposed to be beautiful yep. all weekend. Um, and then, of course, Mother Nature decides to come in and make our weekend really interesting, where we like to tap dance and find new ways to do things. And first overtime of the year, um, as you probably saw with the race, Martin Truex led he dominated a lot of the race. I mean, he got a stage win in there. And then, um, you know, things happened. There was a lot of movement there, especially towards the end. Well, what was yeah. your takeaway from Richmond? You know, it was really interesting because for most of the race, it was quite a w rhythmic race, right? Yeah. Like it was, there weren't a lot of big wrecks. There weren't a lot of like big upsets. And then we have that spin at the end that yeah. causes the overtime. And everybody goes down pit road takes tires, does their thing because obviously our tires are getting eaten up. And Martin Truex Jr., who was in the lead, loses the lead. And Denny Hamlin gets it with his pit crew. And you see on this restart, so they come to the restart zone and Denny Hamlin jumps a little bit before it. And in NASCAR, you have a restart zone, which is the leader controls the restart and you can restart anywhere from the beginning of the restart zone, which is a line on the track, and the end of the restart zone, which is another line on the track. And if you go before it, you can get in trouble. Denny Hamlin went before it, and Martin yeah. Truex Jr. was mad. Oh, my goodness. He was so mad about this. Because, as, like, as you can expect, if someone jumps early and it doesn't get called, yes, it's a human error. Officiating, like, officiating errors they happen in all sports and people get upset about them. This was just an officiating error. Martin Truex Jr. was not happy. Um, he ended up smacking into a bunch of people at the end of the race. Um, Denny Hamlin won. Martin Truex Jr. was smacking into Kyle Larson, smacking into Denny Hamlin. Kyle Larson gets out of the car and he goes, what did I do? I know. <laughs> and MTJ was just mad. Understandably. I get it. Like, yeah. It's, you get mad about these things. And to be honest, I appreciate <laughs> him showing his anger, right? I mean, it shows he's still so passionate about his job. You know, everyone keeps questioning, oh, you're going to, are you going to retire soon? Or is this it? And sometimes you can tell when the guys are veteran drivers and they're kind of ready for the next phase of their life, but it just shows you how much he truly still wants to be there, wants to win. As you're talking about the pit crews, they capitalized on their opportunity. It just shows you how talented they are. And they put Denny in that position. Denny gambled. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very clear, right? You know, we can't, there's a lot of back and forth. Um, NASCAR approved it, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he jumped the restart there a little bit. <laughs> he, he capitalized on his moment you know and he even said he saw martin coming and he's just he went for it i mean he's a, he's a competitor so he gambled and and he won have you ever seen that video um it's a very famous video i don't know where it's from where it's like high school football i think and one of the players like the guy who i don't know the guy who's supposed to toss the ball to the quarterback i don't know who, who that guy is <laughs> <laughs> but either him or the quarterback they just get the ball and they start Spencer. walking. Yeah. And they, and they, you got it. There we go. I don't know. I don't know any <laughs> of their names. It's just because um, my little boys are, they're football and husband are all football people. There we go. There we go. They get the ball and they start walking and they just walk through the defense and then they start running toward the end zone and they got a touchdown because they confused everybody. Right. Yeah. And it's like, you could be mad about that, but also did Denny get away with it? Yeah, he did. So it is what it is. Yeah. And all the Denny fans are so excited <laughs> right now. But you know what is so crazy? And yes, it is a big deal because it's right there at the very end. They're in overtime. Yes, it's it's who's going to win this race. But there's been a huge uproar over this. I feel like because Denny has such a... <laughs> He's got a lot of fans, but he's got a lot of people that love to get on his case. My gosh, he makes one like you know, mistake. Well, it. here's the thing, Monica, Kyle Bush, he went to Richard Childress racing. He went to Chevy. We got to find someone else to be mad at. <laughs> and that's <Right>. Denny. <laughs> but you know what? Denny, I think enjoys it. And it, yeah, it, it does. fuels him, right? I mean, he talks about it on his podcast or during interviews as well. And 
it, you know, it is what it is. He, he, it's like, you know, at least people are paying attention. I totally agree. And before we get to fan questions, because we have some fan questions, I have to ask Monica, working at Richmond and you have a rain delay, is that like, is the pacing weird for you? Because the, the race honestly started before I thought it was going to start because they went out on those damp track tires yeah. earlier than I thought they would and earlier than everyone thought they would. What happens with you as far as like pacing and fan engagement on the TV screen and stuff like that? What do yeah. you have to do? Yeah. I mean, we're just kind of tap dancing. So I had a ton of interviews I was supposed to do throughout the whole day, really. And things were getting canceled left and right because at one point it was pouring and then the rain stopped and then you're trying to squeeze in that interview. And then, so we're just, we're running here and then waiting and then running here and then waiting. But I will have to say, you know, kudos to NASCAR for just going for it with the rain tires or else it could have been, I don't know, a two or three hour delayed race. It could have been later than that, shorter than that. Cause people don't realize it takes, you know, what, two hours to dry the track. Um, and it's hard to please everybody, right? Mm -hmm. You want to, it's Easter Sunday. People are spending their Sunday at the racetrack and they want to see a race. So NASCAR is doing more as far as giving them more options to, with the rain tires to be able to race in that manner, right? So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, to answer your question, it was a lot of tap dancing, mm -hmm. uh, but we got the race in. So we're all excited on our end. That works. You know, you're very good at picking up on things and like switching up very quickly. That's one thing I really like about this podcast is that me and you both like feed off of each other. And when we deviate ever, we're really good at like still deviating, but bringing it back around. Circling <laughs> back is what we call it. We love to circle back. We love to, we love to check back in, get back to where we're supposed to be. <laughs> and I just like that. And Monica, you're such a true professional and I well, really you. appreciate you. You know, I just, what do they say? You just fake it till you make it, right? Exactly. I totally agree. And now we have some fan questions. Yeah, if do. you didn't know, Monica and I, every once in a while, we'll post on Twitter or we'll post on our Instagram stories and we'll say, hey, do y'all have any questions for us? Please ask. And people ask. And it's really, really nice. So we love first it. question, we have British villain in ATL. That's that's our that's our at. <laughs> and you know what? I love that. There's a lot going on there. And it says, will the NASCAR Netflix series do the same for NASCAR as Drive to Survive did for Formula One? Monica, what do you think? I mean, I think any exposure for NASCAR is great. I think that Netflix is a great platform. It has tons of viewership. Um, and I know a lot of people who aren't huge NASCAR fans or would have a preconceived notion about NASCAR and what it's really about. And then they watch the Netflix episodes and were like, oh, I didn't realize it was like this. And, and it, they, it brought on a whole new appreciation for the sport. Um, I think it's great. And yeah, I mean, I, I, hope, I hope they bring all of that back. And I know some of the drivers are hoping that too. It brings on a whole new audience. It shows personality. Um, it just shows more than what the actual race shows, right? It's, 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 uh, it's really interesting. What's your take on it? I fully agree. I also think it's very hard for anybody in any sport to recreate what happened with drive to survive in formula one, because that came out right at the beginning of lockdowns and the pandemic, yeah. nobody had anything to do and it just boomed in popularity. It reached so many people. It will be very, very hard for anybody to recreate that. It's also very hard to recreate what you see in Formula One because Formula One is all of these very, very, very wealthy men doing yeah. wealthy men things, it's right? It's totally different. <laughs> it's totally different. And then NASCAR is like, you have my buddy Tyler Reddick and his cat walking across <laughs> His kitchen counters in, yeah. on the NASCAR show. And, and the wives different... chugging beer in Victory Lane, you know? <laughs> Literally, it's a different kind of atmosphere. And I think yeah. you can really appreciate both. Do I think you can fully recreate what Formula One did? No, because Formula One creates this essence of you can watch us, but you can't really like touch us, right? Like you can't get to us. Whereas NASCAR creates this, this environment of... You can watch us and you can come say hi. And I think that's yeah. wonderful. Did it achieve the goal of capturing those people who were already invested due to Drive to Survive? 
yes. Did it go as big as Drive to Survive? I don't think so, but I think it it hit the goals it was supposed to hit. Yeah, absolutely. All right, next mm-hmm. question is from Andrea is lost. Girlfriend, I am too half the time. I don't know that name. <laughs> <laughs> um, she, she's asking, how do you think NASCAR will change in the next few years? And do you anticipate anything new? Yes, yes, and yes. NASCAR is always <laughs> changing from the schedule. I mean, they added Chicago Street Course. The whole schedule this year has been changed up. Uh, we've got the Clash. There's the type of car, right? We have the next gen car. The body style is different. Short track packages. So yes, it's constantly changing. They brought out the you know the rain tires this weekend. So it's it's always on the move for sure. What do you think? Mm-hmm. So we got a bunch of fan questions and then we got this one from my friend, Andrea. I've actually known Andrea since I was in like second grade. Oh, really? (laughs) I adore Andrea. She supports everything I do. She's so sweet. I love that. uh, So thank you, Andrea, for this question. Yeah, NASCAR is going to change a bunch in the next few years. I'm really interested to see what happens with the NASCAR Clash in particular. I love the NASCAR Clash at the Los Angeles Coliseum, but there's been talk that it will move somewhere else, go international, go somewhere. If it does go there, I'm going. I'm there. I so want to see whatever happens. I anticipate a lot of new stuff in NASCAR in the next few years. As much stuff as we've seen in the past few years, probably not. I talked to Ben Kennedy recently, and I actually wrote an ESPN story about it, um, where we talked about the different things that NASCAR has done in the past like four or five years, and also what they're going to do in the next few years. And Ben said, you know, we had this big like reinvention period where we just threw tons of stuff out there and we saw what worked. We put the clash on a road course. We took the clash to LA. We did the Charlotte Roval. We went to Chicago. Yeah. We went to North Wilkesboro. And he was like, are just things going to change? In the future? Exactly. Right. Yeah. He's, he said, are things going to change in the future? Yes. Are they going to change to that same level and that same pace of change? No, but they will change. And he also said, um, one thing that they're constantly reevaluating is the playoffs, the order of the playoffs, the venues, all of that. And he said, have we enjoyed having the final race of the season at Phoenix? Yes. Will we stay there forever? No, that it's going to change. So even our big championship race is going to change eventually. Right. So these things will change. A few things will stay the same. The Daytona 500 is always going to stay the same stuff like that. (laughs) But we are going to see a lot of changes, and I think that's fun because I've really enjoyed the past few years. Our final fan question is from at jhaw42. What is the most amazing slash favorite tailgating hack or setup that you've seen from a fan? I have an answer immediately. Monica, do you want me to go first? Yeah. This was years ago, probably like a decade ago. I saw on television, I think Clint Boyer, I feel like, was running around, and he found some fans with a pool in the tailgate of their truck. Oh yeah. But I think they were like also heating it. It was a Talladega. And so it was like a a truck bed hot tub. And I have been dreaming of doing that at Talladega ever since. You need to get on that. So I've been on the road here. I mean, years, 17 years. I don't (laughs) even know the number anymore. So I've seen, I have seen a lot. I have seen some of the best tailgating spots with like bars and a band and they have, you know, campers where they have lined up like u shape, so it keeps the party in Mm -hmm. um i have seen people riding around on motorized coolers so you have a ride i feel like i've also seen this yes and yeah they've been around for a while and you have your cold drinks with you that's a Mm -hmm. win-win and then um out in phoenix a few years ago i got to take a ride on like a a recliner chair you're and kidding me. Cup I've seen those. I've seen yeah. those. Oh, yeah. It was amazing. So I rode around the infield. It was perfect. You have a comfy chair and a wow. place for your drink. It was awesome. I mean, the the ideas are endless. There's so many out there. I've seen the, um, you know, where the school buses are now campers. And there's wow. so many out there. But, yeah, if you go to Talladega and walk down Talladega Boulevard, you will you'll see, see some it. things you can't look away from. And you'll see some things you'll never forget. Yeah. <laughs> But we've had a lot of Alanis and Monica conversation today, and I think it is now time to bring in 
Kenny Wallace. The theme of today's show is media influencers, how social media has changed sports and changed the world and everything like that. We have lots of big media influencers in NASCAR. We have Tony Breidinger. We have Haley Deegan, who was on Mics Are Hot recently. If you want to listen to that episode, go check it out. She was really great. And also recently, we have Denny Hamlin embracing this. But we also have Kenny Wallace, who puts every single thing he thinks online. And I absolutely love that. And I'm so excited to have him today. All right. And welcome to the show, Kenny Wallace, the Hermanator. Herman, you probably take any name at this point, don't you? I do. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, sometimes they call me Kenny. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> but, you know, my nickname... Uh, when I was a kid was Herman the German, and then it went to Herman, and then when I moved to North Carolina, it was uh, the Hermanator, and I said, I, love I, li that. I like that one. I like, I like the Hermanator. Well, tell us real quick, though, how did you get the name Herman? Well, my dad was winning a lot of races here, you know, around the St. Louis area, and the fans did not like us. Uh, my mom, myself, we fought the fans, we grew up fighting, and uh, there was a big German man. His name was Bob Mueller. Bob, God, he stood every bit of, uh, you know, six, 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 seven. Had a crew cut, and he was from <laughs> he was from Germany. And he said, "You're Herman the German," and uh, that was it. Bob Mueller uh, nicknamed me that. So Bob, mm -hmm. it's all because of Bob, and it stuck with you. I love it. I yeah. love that too. Wow. I get a lot of different names, but it's usually just different pronunciations of my name. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I get Palumbo on the jumbo, Palabimbo, Palabumbo. Okay. That's cute though. All the things. Palumbo on the jumbo is cute. <laughs> it's fun. Well, let's talk <laughs> Richmond. I mean, we saw, you know, some tire fall off, not quite like Bristol, but a lot of tempers flare, a lot of storylines. What's your takeaway from Richmond? Well, I like Richmond. It was one of my best tracks. Uh, but my takeaway is, you know, it reminds me of that song, Let's Get to the Good Part, you know? <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, first of all, my takeaways are this. Uh, the race started two hours before it would have started because they had that new rain tire. And, you know, when they went green flag, uh, there was water, there was mist flying. So that was a home run uh, from that standpoint where they said, okay, we're going to run the jet dryers around here a little, a couple times and we're going green flag. Yes. So that, that means we didn't get started at 10 at night. Agreed. You know, we, we got started at eight. That was, that was a big thing. And I think a lot of fans overlooked that. Um, and then like, let's get to the good part. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, the, there's so many conspiracy theories, uh, and I hate to disappoint people, but you know, um, uh, you know, what caused that last caution was, you know, it got debullshitted, you know, after the race where Kyle Larson said, I got loose. I had to let out of the gas and Bubba Wallace finished me off. So that was a legit caution because you have Kyle Larson in the infield going through the water and he's got to get back on the track. They had to throw the caution. And then, of course, that sets up all the controversy. And then my heart started sinking for Martin Truex. I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy has led this whole damn race. And mm -hmm. we've seen this over and over. And now these poor crew member, they got to give the, the pit stop of their life. Yeah. Denny Hamlin comes in third behind Joey Logano, comes out in the lead. And then, you know, uh, I can't even believe... You know, I don't want to be long-winded, but but I just no, got to say this. Well, life, life is so funny. I cannot believe that this controversy of, for example, oh my gosh, Denny Hamlin took off 10 feet early. <laughs> like, okay, he did. It was illegal. He should have not done it. But like everybody admits it. Everybody says he took off early and you kind of would think that would be the end, but it, it's like, <laughs> it's like a dog getting a rat in its mouth. It will not let it go. Yeah. Um, I think the fans want NASCAR to apologize. And Elton Sawyer came out on Monday morning on Sirius XM and said, look, we got it wrong, but don't try it again. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, uh, 
hell of a show. I mean, yeah. Na- yeah. NASCAR, NASCAR keeps, keeps delivering every week, whether the fans like it or not. And it was another great finish. Yeah. I totally agree. And a thing Monica and I were actually talking about earlier was officiating errors happen all the time. <laughs> they happen in all kinds of sports. It, it just gets messed up. It happens. And whoever benefits from that benefits from it. And whoever doesn't, doesn't. Like, do I think it's important for NASCAR to say, don't try it again? Yes, because NASCAR and motorsports are historically an area where people go, oh, can I get away with this? I will. You know, I'm going to try. So it's important for them to say that. But also, it was just a mistake. It's human error. I'm a race car driver still to this day. Yes, you are. Social media (laughs) and Kenny conversation and mics are hot. They found me. So my point is, I'm going to put everybody in the driver's seat. And even before Danny explained it on Actions Detrimental, put yourself in his position. Okay, we're, we're, we're coming green flag. Danny looks in his mirror and he sees Joey Logano lagging back. Now, Joey's going to get this run on him. And then and then Danny looks to the right of him, and he sees the world attacking him. Yeah. They're, they're, they're getting ready to beat him like a drag race. So he's like, oh, my God, they're coming at me. I'm going. So we, we've already said he jumped the start. That That's over here. Mm-hmm. Why did he jump the start? And the reason he jumped the start, because he could tell they were getting ready to jump him. And and this takes me back to when Carl Edwards lost the championship. And inevitably, the reason he quit the sport, because Joey Logano got a good start in third position, got underneath Carl Edwards, and they wreck. And inevitably, that wreck is why Carl Edwards quit NASCAR. So... I saw Joey Logano getting ready to do the exact same thing where he's going to jump Denny Hamlin, go to the left, and we're going to wreck down in turn one. Now, all I'm saying is this. That's why Denny Hamlin took off. Yeah, and it's in his blood, right? If you're a competitor at any degree, it's in your blood. You see somebody coming, you're going. I'm like that at a red light. It turns green. No, I'm going, you know, it's just not getting me. Yeah. Monica, you, you got, you got to wait a couple of seconds. Cause what if somebody runs the light? What if somebody runs the light? I go protect yourself. Okay. Okay. As long as you're looking, I just need you to protect yourself. Okay. So Kenny, you said you are still a race car driver. You have been a race car driver for a long time. You've had a great career. You grew up in a racing family. Everybody knows the last name Wallace. What are some of the pros and cons of growing up like that? Well, um, most people think I'm mean because my brother Rusty <laughs> Me <too>. is mean. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so I love my brother Rusty <laughs> to death. And, and, and listen, I'm going to take the words. Everybody knows how close me and Rusty and Mike are. Uh, I love my brothers. We get along really good, but Rusty sat me down, um, uh, And he said one time to me, he says, Kenny, don't change. He said, I can piss off people way quicker than you can. So my brother, Rusty, was good. He won 55 cup races. He's a champion. He was brass. Uh, Is that the word? He he was rough around the edges. Mm -hmm. And, And so growing up, a Wallace was like, look, that's Rusty. I'm Kenny. Um, however, you know, Mike's are hot gives me an opportunity. This is my therapy session too. Yay. You know? <laughs> I love that. That's what we're here for. Yeah. So I wished I was a little bit more like Rusty because Mike, I, I feel like if I would have been more aggressive with my team, maybe they would have fired me. <laughs> uh, but Rusty was so in control that he literally ran Roger Penske because he won races uh, my brother, Mike, uh, my brother, Mike can live on land itself. I mean, Mike doesn't need anybody. People say, what's your brother Mike up to nowadays? I said, well, hold on. Let's back up. Mike is the most raw talent. Mike can flat drive a car. Uh, but what got Mike into trouble a little bit was he tried to run the team. So Mike's a businessman. Uh, so what was it like growing up being Wallace? You know, I would like to, take pieces of my brothers and I'd like to 
you know, fit me in there somewhere. Uh, but I'm happy with who I am. Um, took me a while to be me and be comfortable with me. Is Kenny Wallace weird? Yes, I'm crazy. <laughs> I'm bad. I'm batshit crazy. Watch out. <laughs> but you know that's what, I mean? what we love about you. You know, you can say, oh, I wish I was more like this. Oh, I wish I was more like that. But I love getting on Twitter or even watching you on, you know, when you're on the Speed Channel. And I just love seeing you talk and your personality and shoot people straight. I think it's one of your best qualities. I, I think it's amazing. Um, and when you're talking about growing up as a Wallace, what are some of your favorite memories? I, I know you were, were you were your dad's mechanic. Is that right? So yes, you're you're right about everything. Uh, well, because I was younger, uh, you know, Rusty is 67, Mike is 64, and I'm 60. So I was always a fabric. I I grew up a fabricator mechanic. You know what I mean? It's like I'm up working on my race car. I wash my hands and I come down and do mics are hot. <laughs> I love so, that. So you know, um, I really enjoyed learning about race cars and growing up in a racing family, looking forward to every weekend we're going racing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's like I tell people, I said, listen, you know, Hank Parker, uh, you know, his dad was a famous fisherman and he was yeah. Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s buddy. And it's like, okay, your dad fishes. So that's what you do. Well, you know, me, we raced. So that's what I did. I'm a little bit like Kyle Petty, you know, uh, I'm a little bit like Michael Walter, you know, we race and that's what we do. So I really enjoyed my nights in the shop, learning to work on race cars. But I, I also feel like I was an all American kid. I loved riding my bicycle. I ran the creeks, had a BB gun. And to this day, you know, those days define me, but you know, then I became worldly and raced in Japan and Mexico and the 24 hour of Daytona. And I feel like, uh, I've done a lot and, uh, but growing up as a child around my brothers, my mom, my dad, uh, I'm like my mom, my mom's wild. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I really liked my childhood. I would not trade it for anything. Yeah. Aww, you got to have so all the experiences. And you I, said your family raced, so you raced. Do you yeah. think you would have gotten into racing if your family hadn't been in? Like, what would you do if your if your family hadn't been into racing? What would you be right now? It's funny because I'm 60. <laughs> I can answer that right away. Oh, I love that. Yay. Well, because I'm wiser, right? I'm older. Mm -hmm. I would have, I love debate. Not, you know, just shy of arguing. It's not, you know, for me, it, it's like, you know, you, when I was in high school, you always heard of these debate classes. I'm like, what yeah. is that? <laughs> it's where you argue respectfully. I'm like, how you, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> right? Because so, uh, I'm going to mother somebody, you know? <laughs> but, but, uh, and by the way, I, di I didn't say it. You didn't I, I say stopped. it. No, you didn't. You, didn't. you said, uh. <laughs> yeah. So I would have liked to have been on uh, AM radio. I love uh, that. I uh, could see that. <laughs> Yeah. And I, and I've said that really, I knew of that early because I mean, when I was 22, people were saying, you know, what would you do if you weren't in race? And I'm like, AM radio. Cause I AM grew radio. up, I grew up listening to it. And I, mm -hmm. I really, as a kid, I was always curious and listening and I don't agree with that. Or I agree with that. And there, there were times I'd call in, you know? <laughs> yeah. But I think it's great. You have an opinion, right? You're not one of those that agrees with everyone. I, I think it's great. You have an opinion. And you stated, um, I know we've been talking about your upbringing, but you got to also work closely with Dale Earnhardt. He gave you your first NASCAR start in the, the Bush series back then. How was it like working yeah. with the Intimidator? Yeah, thanks for asking that. I don't talk about that that much. Um, so I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and we're a Midwest family, and we raced around here. Uh, you know, my dad was really good, won 400 local races but never did what Rusty did. And we, we found ourselves traveling and we'd go up to, we'd go three hours up the road and race Mark Martin in Springfield, Missouri uh, and the great Larry Phillips. And then, and then, you know, we started racing USAC, which was against AJ Foyt and all these great racers. Well, um, I became a crew chief in 1984 in the cup series with Joe Rutman, 
uh, in the Levi Garrett car. So finally, at 22 years old, I finally became a race car driver. Uh, my, my career started really late. And Brother Rusty, I, I would say, if you asked Rusty right now, I'll never forget Rusty saying, Herm, we're going to take a couple shortcuts because you helped me so much you know, because I was the kid brother. Yeah. I was all rusty. I was all Mike. I was a tire changer, fabricator. I was all in with my brothers. So once I got racing, I was in ASA, 1986, 87. Well, in 88, I ran three years of racing in the Midwest. And Rusty calls me up and he says, hey, I want to start you in an Xfinity team. What? <laughs> what? To answer your question. I could not go to Daytona and just show up. NASCAR said, we got to see you race. Mm -hmm. So my mom, my wife, they put this portfolio together, sent it to Les Richter. And they, they saw that I ran my ASA car at Michigan and Michigan Speedway and Winchester Speedway in Salem. But they said, okay, that's not enough. We want to see you. So Rusty, I raced Dale Sr., in ASA, Senior had a car and ran ASA, the St. Paul, Minnesota State Fair. So here's where we get to. So um, Earnhardt says, uh, Dale Senior says, Herman, let's put you in my Xfinity, my number eight, GM Goodrich Chevrolet. So by God, we go to uh, November of 1988. We go to Martinsville. And I run 12th, and there it is. I'm in the GM Goodrich Chevrolet. <laughs> That's awesome. And, uh, yeah, so NASCAR watched me race. They looked at my portfolio, and that made it to where in 1989, they, NASCAR approved me, and I went to Daytona and set quick time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. So, so because of Dale Sr. letting me drive his car and NASCAR watching me, they said, okay, he, he's he's good to go. And, and his portfolio about him racing Winchester and Michigan Speedway. So that's the whole story. That is I love super that. cool. How was Dale Sr.? I know people love hearing stories about him, but how was it that particular race uh, working for him? So let me back up a little bit. First of all, uh, he was a man's man. Every Every man wanted to be him. He could just jump in that race car with this gangly mustache, these big ass gargoyle sunglasses. <laughs> and it's like every man wanted to be him because he could just drive the crap out of that race car out of control. And, and you know, Earnhardt was in control, but when he was out of control, it was highlight reel. Mm -hmm. it, it, and he just wrecked the hell out of people and never apologized about it. And it's so different because nowadays people are complaining. He did not hold his lane. I'm like, hold your lane. You you never raced Dale senior. Did you? Right. Uh, it's like, this is, you know, in my day, you know, all the highlights are out there. Look at Dale senior, you know, wreck Terry Labonte. I mean, wrecking at, at, uh, you know, Bristol, uh, you know, look, look at Earnhardt rough, you know, Bill Elliott up going through the grass for the all-star race. Earnhardt laid a bumper to you. So we all wanted to be like that, but we did not have enough talent because he, he was in control of his car. Mm -hmm. The car was not in control of him. So he was so good uh, that, yeah, we all wanted to be like him. Now, that's the driving part. He was a very unique individual because... Just when you thought he was your buddy, <laughs> then the next day he would ignore you and just, oh. just crush you, hurt your feelings. And it's like, I thought I was his friend. Well, that was his way of making sure you did not think you were getting too close to him. You, you, listen, he loved me. He was good to me. But then all of a sudden, you know, and now that I look back at it, sometimes this was at the racetrack. Mm -hmm. And he did say, I remember Dale Sr. saying to me, we don't do business at the racetrack. We're there to race. We're not signing any contracts. 
with Don Hawk or Bruton Smith were at the racetracks to race. And I remember him saying that. So I think some of that with Dale Sr. was because he didn't want to deal with it. Loved him, wanted to be like him. He was a man's man. And then he would give you a crushing blow. He would strong arm you, stay away. I don't want to talk to you right now. <laughs> but when I won my first race, and I, I, won a, I won a big race in Loudon, New Hampshire, the Bud 300. And uh, it was a good win. And he says, come on up here. We're, we're going we're gonna to have lunch. So I went up to his shop. And there was, you know, all these deer heads and a Tony Urey Jr., Tony Urey Sr. <laughs> and he just threw down a plate of spaghetti and salad. And I just sat there on his picnic bench and he ate lunch with me. And, you know, those are moments etched into my brain forever. He, he looked at me and he said, good job. He said, a lot of people are afraid to win. They don't know how to finish it off. So, yeah, there's a lot more stories, but, um, yeah, we all wanted to be him. He would hurt your feelings. He would make you feel good. It was like a marriage. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. that was that was so fascinating. Like, thank you for taking the time to talk about that because that yeah. was really, really interesting. Yeah, it was different back in those days. The racing ethics were different. And I think that's another reason I'm so opinionated because when I hear people complain right now, today, I look at them, I'm like... <laughs> You wouldn't have made it in our day, yeah. which, which I don't go down that road. I, I, I don't, I don't say I had to walk through the snow and well, what, what <laughs> I'm saying, both ways. Yeah, <laughs> what I'm saying, ladies is my, how the ethics of racing have changed. You mm -hmm. know, back then you did what it took to win. Yeah. Nowadays, if, if you, if you, if you, if you, you know, kind of lean on somebody, he didn't give me no room. It's like, right, I'm not yeah. going to give you any room. It's for the win. I better get an apology. <laughs> no, hey, they're you trying know to win. At least, at least it's better than Formula One, where Formula One, if you so much as look at another driver, it's like, he's looking at me. He's looking at me. <laughs> Can we penalize him? He looked at me. <laughs> That's Until hysterical. I, yeah, but you know what? That, that is so, so <laughs> accurate. Uh you know, and, and then of course, of course, me, I'm a character. So I'm like, listen to the words. He, sh he shunt. I'm like, what does that mean? He, he hit huh? me. I'm like, oh, he knocked the hell out of you. You know, th they got these words that are very European and I love them. He shunt. <laughs> but I like to make fun of them too, you know? <laughs> yeah. Just shoot me straight. I don't know all these fancy words. Yeah. You, like mean, he, he, you, you mean he shunt? You know? <laughs> but, he shouldn't but do yeah, but Formula One, I mean, you literally. You, you you chop a guy and they're like, 20 second penalty. Why? Because you didn't hold your lane. I'm like, well, damn, that's pretty hard. That's pretty yeah. harsh. You that's know? pretty harsh. But also, I mean, Formula One has very strict rules about if it's your corner, it's your corner. And obviously they don't want the wheels overlapping because that can lead to some very dangerous things in a sport like Formula One. But sometimes you're watching it and a teammate will be like, I'm faster than my teammate. Let me pass. Let me pass. Let me pass. And it's like, let yourself pass. Just pass. Just drive the car. <laughs> I've um, I like this conversation because I'm, I, I've been studying it. I've been learning. You know, you know, it's like wine in a vineyard. It, it's mm -hmm. it's got a vibe, right? So mm -hmm. it, it's more than drinking the wine. It's 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 beautiful. We're all getting a little shit faced. You know, it, <laughs> we're, we're getting drunk politely. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, 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 well and that is said. Exact, You're so right. <laughs> Yeah, and that's exactly the way Formula One is. I mean, You're it's so right. it's like we're, we're we're dealing with these sophisticated race cars. <laughs> They're racing, but that's not really the big deal. Here, here comes Max Verstappen. Ten seconds later, here comes a second place car. Hey, by the way, hey, can you fill my wine up? And, oh, oh my, my God, goodness. look at look at the Ferrari and the Mercedes of the Benzes. <laughs> And look at the beautiful people. You're not and exaggerating. That's how it is. I'm understanding the vibe. I, I, I so badly want to go to a Formula One race because I, I like Formula One now more because now I get it. It's, it's, it's like a vineyard and, yeah. and it's like wine. And, and now I get it. Now I get Kenny, it. Kenny, my first Formula One race, I was in the Ferrari suite 
and we had a four course lobster lunch. I was like, no way. You know, I, all the tablecloths were white. Everyone was dressed in all white. They all had their heels on. And the, I was like, you know what? I don't eat lobster. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to bail out of this one. Four course lobster lunch during Ooh. like practice. In Na- the Ferrari suite. In, in NASCAR, you get a hot dog, you know? You get, you get a hot, <laughs> literally, you get a hot dog and you or, get like a hamburger. <laughs> yeah, in NASCAR, if they put like mushrooms and onions on top of the hamburger, like that's it's fancy. fancy. You yeah, know? that is. Woo. <laughs> and, and if you don't eat that, that junky hot dog at Martinsville, you ain't, you're bad. You, it, 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 it's like people, <laughs> people brag on that hot dog and I'm like... <laughs> Come on. I mean, it is just God awful looking. You, know? <laughs> no, no. you have to have at least one though, but yeah, it's, oh, yeah. I tell oh, you, no. I, at circuit of the Americas at the NASCAR race the other week, they had French fries at every single meal in the media center. <laughs> and I was like, let's go. It's French fry time. Yeah. <laughs> or, or when you go to Atlanta, that quick trip would sponsor, you know, the media room and it's just full of donuts. Perfect. <laughs> I'm like, ah. Listen, Listen I up. love it. <laughs> I know. Well, we've been talking about racing and now you're doing a lot of on camera stuff. Well, you've been doing on camera stuff for a while now, but how was that transition like from going from, you know, a full time race car driver over to Fox or speed at so, the time? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you my truth, and I've told this story, but not really uh, this way. So when when I, first of all, let me back way up. Uh, Ed Gorn was the president of Fox Sports, okay? Now Eric Shanks is. Eric mm-hmm. Shanks is the boss. Nobody bigger than him. Uh, years ago, Ed Gorn was the, Ed, uh, you know, Eric Shanks. So they called me. And they said, we want you to be part of, you know, Daryl Walter, Larry McReynolds, Jeff Hammond. And man, I was just not ready. I was 36 years old. They wanted me to quit racing. And I mean, I talked uh, uh, Howie uh, Long, you know, uh, I, I, it was, it was a very difficult decision for me to go into TV because I always pride myself that, listen, I'm a race car driver. So I became a little bitter in the TV compound because people were bragging on me. They're like, Oh, you're so good at TV. And I'm like, no, I don't want to be good at TV. (laughs) So the joke in the TV compound was, Hey, race car driver. (laughs) And I'm like, that's right. And by the way, I'm running my dirt car this week. So, Mm -hmm. so I, um, I begrudgingly, I was at the Chicago O'Hare airport. Never forget it like yesterday. My palms started getting sweaty. My heart started pounding. And I went ahead and I called uh, Ed Gorn. And I said, you know, I'm crushed. I don't, it it looks like I'm not going to be Jeff Gordon. And I I was holding out. I thought I was going to be Jeff Gordon. And then I realized I'm going to be about a, a B minus driver. And it looks like I'm just going to get these rides, uh, you know, and, and I had no bitterness towards that because when I got in Steve Park's car, I set quick time and I run second. When I, when I got in Ernie Irvin's Texaco car, I, you know, I ran good, you know? So I realized the timing was not going to be right for me to become great. So it was at that time uh, I called him. I said, okay, I know it's six years later but I will do TV. So then the next call I got was from Patty Wheeler. And they're like, okay, let's get your reps in. Let's, let's teach you to be a TV guy. And, um, so they had speed TV and it was absolutely wonderful. It was so much fun. I could race my race car. I could run the Xfinity series. I could run the cup series in the furniture row car. Cause I was the first, you know, I helped furniture row get started. It, and everything was good because when I did TV back in those days, they were just, I, I was in my fire suit getting on for victory, NASCAR victory lane. And I, I'd get out of the car. They'd give me my Gatorade, my towel, and I'd get on TV in my fire suit. It wasn't until 2015. I said, okay, I, I'm retiring from being a race car driver. And I'll never forget Eric Shanks going, okay, 
you work for us now. And that was my death sentence. Uh, that's when, that's when they, they gave me a piece of paper. They go, here's the piece of paper. I'm like, what's this? Well, we noticed you, you, you used the word seen and the word saw in the wrong places. I'm like, right. Cause, cause I'm not real good at the English language. I'm like Larry McReynolds. I, I'm a redneck as hell. Mm-hmm. And now you're trying to clean me up. You know, you're trying to make me be an English major. I'm not an English major. You are. Mm-hmm. So it, it went south from there. Uh, now, th- listen, they were good to me. They paid me good. But inevitably, what was the end was I got very depressed. Uh, I was going to the airport, which is a hellhole, yeah. fighting these people, getting on the airplane, uh, you know, the, getting the getting the luggage, either checking it in or getting it, you know, just a commercial airport is is a shithole <laughs> and, and, and then getting off the airplane and going, getting on the bus to get the rental car and then it's getting, a lot. yeah, I mean, it is an ordeal. I don't care if you're 20 years old to get to your room. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was spoiled. I was a race car driver and I had my own airplane and I had my own bus and, and boy, when you go to work for a living, it is a bitch. And uh, I said, you know what? I'm miserable. I'm watching my buddies. I got my cell phone out and, and I'm watching my buddies race dirt, you know, on a Friday or Saturday night. I'm holed up in my hotel room. Yeah. My life is junk. So I formulated this letter in my notes section and I sent it to Steve Craddock. And I said, listen, you all have been incredible to me. You, you've given me nine lives. I said, but regretfully, don't get mad at me, but I'm quitting. And here's why. So we met at a steakhouse in Richmond and he said, what is this all about? And I told him everything and, uh, everybody agreed with me. And, uh, so TV, TV saved my life, but inevitably was the death of me being miserable. Cause I'm not used to working for people yeah. and, and I, I'm not used to that commercial airport. Ooh, and it wears I said, you out. I do it all the it, time. Ooh. Oh, it does wear you out. I went for a work thing probably a few months ago, showed up at my local airport. It has two gates, two gates, okay? They took the people who were doing check-in and they left during check-in period. So they wouldn't let me check my bag. And they told me I had to come back eight hours later and get on a different flight. And maybe I would make it to my destination, but maybe not because I was on standby. They just left the check-in area. And I'm like, okay, I love flying commercial. This is great. The stuff (laughs) stuff you have to deal with. But no, Kenny, you did such a fabulous job. We would work the stage next to you, you know, back in the sprint days. And they had the speed stage there. And it was was so much fun. I like like both of you ladies. I want want to say this, Monica... Alanis, I love you both uh, for the, for the same for the same reasons. You know, Monica, I watched you. Uh, you know, we we're basic kind of a team. You know, and, and you know, uh, Monica, you were doing your deal, and Alanis, <laughs> uh, I appreciate you for being so raw, oh, thank and you, uh, you know, uh, on social media. So uh, you know, we all do our own deal. You know, yeah. we just do our deal and try to fit in. Kenny, I appreciate you being so raw and honest too. And I think we we have a similar thing where people think you're kind of mean. People think I'm kind of mean. And then they meet me and they're like, oh, you're so nice. I remember I was doing a story with Alex Bowman last year. And I was told right before I got there that Alex was like, wait, isn't she kind of mean? <laughs> and they were like, no, she's really nice. And I met Alex and we got along great. And he was like, oh, okay, she's not scary. <laughs> <laughs> but people think I'm mean too. And it's just because we're honest. Yeah. Right. It, it really is. It's just because we're honest. And our theme today is actually media influencers like we all are. So one of my question is what made you decide to go into YouTube podcasting and be a dedicated internet personality? Like you have your racing career, you have your TV career, did it just kind of naturally happen to where you were talking a lot online or did you make a conscious decision to do this? So this is the part where, uh, this is what I've been known for is being brutally honest. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I'm going to tell you when social media started for me and why I was ahead of everybody. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to make it a short story. 
because I can make it long. <laughs> uh, my sponsor was the U.S. Border Patrol. Mm -hmm. And the objective was that the Border Patrol was dirty. There was not good employees. So they came to NASCAR. They put their name on the Xfinity car I was driving. And they were behind the grandstands and they were trying to find, they were trying to, U.S. Border was trying to start over with all new employees. So they said, okay, we are not going to sponsor you at Montreal, Canada, because it doesn't do us any good to put the U.S. Border Patrol logo on a car in Canada. We're not looking for employees in Canada. So my car owner, Jay Robinson, looked me right now and he goes, when we go to Canada, we're going to start and park. And I said, no, no. A Wallace don't start and park. Look, <laughs> right. if, I, if, I, if I'm broke ass, I'll, we do what we got to do, but I'm not broke. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to Canada to start the motor up, run around and pull in, you know. So somebody said, uh, you should do a fan car. Now, this is how we started. This is how I started social media. I said, a fan car. So what are you thinking? They said, get everybody to pitch in $20. And make your whole car everybody's name. And I said, well, how am I going to do this? And they said, go to Facebook. And I mm -hmm. said, that's, that's like for children. And, they, <laughs> and I didn't know anything oh. about social media. So now I'm going to fast forward. $225,000 later. Yay. I write a check to my car owner. I write a check to the people that did it all. And I got all this money. Wow. And I looked around and I said, boy, oh boy, I'm, I, I couldn't tell anybody. And I'm like, oh my God, you can make this much money in social media. So I became this crazed lunatic and could never tell anybody the story until right now. So wow. I made, I made massive amount of money doing social media and I just had to let everybody make fun of me for so many years and now everybody's come to me I, i'm yeah. the man i won and now it's time to tell you know it, it's like you know now all the race teams got social media gurus i'm like totally you know now they all come to me but i could not tell them at that time because you know here you, you don't talk about religion or money right mm -hmm. so or politics those three things well, I couldn't tell people how much money I made on friggin' Facebook because, <laughs> because how am I going to get the message out that you can put your name on my car? How do mm -hmm. you do that? Okay. I wasn't going to buy advertising on TV. I wasn't going to do it, you know, in the grand national scene or a publication. And I hired two people. They got paid incredibly good. That is how I got into social media and the rest is just part of the game. You know? I love that. I, I mean, do too. I made so much damn money that it's like, well, hell, I'm just going to keep this up. It's going to keep doing this. You should. <laughs> Here you we should. go. Good. Yeah. I want to know too, cause you know, you have uh, coffee with Kenny and you know, we've been talking about how honest you are online and on social media. You literally take social media by the horns and I'm always so curious too, because there's so many trolls out there, right? Everyone's behind a screen. Not everyone. There are some mean people out there behind a screen <laughs> saying rude, rude things or mean things. We see it all the time. I'm just so curious how you handle those kind of people. Do you just ignore them? Do you, it, you sometimes you kind of talk back. So I see Alanis go through this and <laughs> let, let, let me tell you my truth. So when social media first started for me, it was, it was, God awful. It was mm -hmm. antagonizing and I, I'm a fighter. So I'm, I'm going back. I, I'm fighting with them. And, um, you know, you wake up every morning to, to argue, let's argue. Come on. So then all of a sudden it was just this period of time where I started really going back to that child's rhyme, uh, six and stones will break my bones, but <laughs> words will never hurt me. And there we go. And I really don't know you. Um, right. And respectfully, excuse me, who are you? Uh, do you pay my check? And then I just, I, 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 uh, 
started understanding this is the rules of engagement. And, you know, so I understand that the F word is provocative, but, but it's kind of, I, I started treating social media, Monica, like Italians do. It's, it's, <laughs> it's like, it's like you too, you know, yeah. it's like, Hey, fuck you. <laughs> Dude, I mean, we're just, we're, we're just all mother in each other 24 <laughs> seven. That's my dad I mean, for you. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, but, but, but I mean, it's like, Hey, you're not getting me. You're not, yeah. you know, go yourself too. See, <laughs> see, I win. So you're not, you're never going to get me. I grew up a lot. I, I think social media was good for me, taught me to be tougher mm -hmm. because I grew up a lover. I, I didn't want to be like Rusty because Rusty was mean. And I'm like, God, he's mean. <laughs> you know, he's so direct with people. My mom was like that. And, and I learned social media taught me to grow really thick skin and I've learned that this is the rules of engagement. When you go on there, be ready to go to war. Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah, I just, I just learned it, you know, and now, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, nobody really gets me anymore. Nobody gets my goat. Uh, really, I find more that I want to educate people. Uh, hey, Wallace, you never won a cup race. You're right. I never won a cup race. I'll go to my grave with that. I run second three times. It hurt like hell. Then they back right down because their objective is to get you. Right. And once you go, once you go, yeah, that sucked. And they're like, oh God, I didn't mean for you to, I wanted you to MF me back. Yeah. I want and you're, you know that what I mean? That engagement. Yeah. They wanted that engagement. They often forget that there's a person on the other side. They often think they're just like tossing things at a wall. And yeah. when you respond, they're like, oh, and I have this a lot where I, I try to be nice to everybody. Now, sometimes I'll mess with you, right? But I'm never being that serious. But I try to be nice and understanding of everyone. And I have cases, this happens all the time, where someone who harassed me years ago will come back around, usually with a different profile or a different email because I blocked the other one <laughs> or, or muted, muted the other one. Yeah, I muted. love muting. I always mute now. I used to block because mute Me didn't too. exist, but muting gives them no satisfaction because they have no idea you muted them. But they usually come back around and they go, I am so sorry I treated you that way. That was so wrong of me and you were so kind and I've grown. And I go, thanks, buddy. Have a good life. Appreciate it. Yeah, and that's I worth it. I find that too. And uh, I want to talk a little bit more about that, but Monica, get with your sisters again and do some of that good stuff that you used to do on oh Instagram. Oh my goodness. You're, you are so that you are so, so every, we look at you as this mature lady, but, but when you get a little wine in you on Instagram, yeah. oh my God, I never, <laughs> I never laughed so hard where you, you make fun of the influencers. So yeah, you we have my this, beautiful um, coffee cup. My <laughs> I love it. Let's so, go. My sister and I have this funny page called Palumbo's Parenting Tips. We're basically oh, yes, hold on. We're oh, making I, well, no. We are not like we're so bootleg. Like I think the last time we did something was probably two years ago. But where you know oh, we make okay. fun of things. Um, we, we pretend like we're being serious, but we're not. You know, because life <laughs> is way too serious, and sometimes you just need to make people laugh right so we have a good time we drink our wine and um so it'll be a while i'm knocked up now so um it'll be a while <laughs> you're pregnant she drink. yeah oh, she yeah. is oh, oh she's getting that <laughs> okay this, this this is my favorite part as you know i'm a girl dad i'm married with three daughters so i'm going to say to you what i say to my daughters do you know what caused that <laughs> um yeah <laughs> Off, Kenny. Okay, no comment. Hey, c congratulations! Thank you. That's awesome. But, but I, had I had a weekend off. That's what happened. And, yeah, but like Father John said, fa Father John, he married, you know, Kim and myself, and you know, focus oh, on the him. fam. Focus on the family is this big Catholic group, and they literally tell you a focus on the family. They say. Don't watch TV, make love to your wife. I'm like, all right. <laughs> okay. okay, done. Yeah. Done. Yeah, Don't I, call me twice. Yeah, right. <laughs> but but Atlantis. Yeah, it, it's good stuff, ain't it? <laughs> good, great, stuff, great stuff. You know, I have a cat. Um, I have a cat. <laughs> <laughs> and you're married. I'm married. That's right. 
No children. I have a cat. She she likes to interrupt. Her name is Portia. She'll come and hit her head on the microphone. She she is my child. I cradle she's her. She's our like mascot. A child. She's my honor roll student. I love her so much, <laughs> and she's our Get, mascot. Getting back to social media, Portia. Yes, I, Portia. I see, yeah, that's that's your cat's name. But I <laughs> getting back to social media. I really feel like the whole world is starting to understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, it's never going to leave because. What happens, and I'm just going to use some numbers. We we start social media at 25 years old, like I did, or whatever. You're, uh, so so 25, 30, 30. Now when I'm 35, now I've learned. I've learned it. But the kids coming up, they haven't learned. They're ready to yeah. do battle and, and hurt feelings. And and then it's like I see everybody, you know, learning about social media now. And, and I want to get back to muting. That's funny. I love muting. Yeah, because they think they're getting you. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and they, they're like, why aren't they responding? And what's funny is I mute a whole bunch of people. And, and I'll see, I'll see the, the mute. It'd be mute, and I, and I laugh, and I think, I, I don't even know what they're saying, but I'm sure they're stirring shit up right away. <laughs> they, they, they've got to understand that I haven't responded to them in like a year. So... <laughs> Yeah. There's one guy, there's one guy I have muted who always responds to my tweets and goes, your husband is awesome, but I don't like you at all. And I'm like, buddy, you've been muted for like three years. <laughs> yeah. He's not seeing it. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. I know, Sorry, I know but... too, with these um, videos that you do, Kenny, are they like, say coffee with Kenny, are they premeditated? Do you, so, or do you just hop on, you just grab your phone and say, all right, I'm having my morning coffee. Let's go. And, yeah. Or afternoon they... coffee. Yeah, they found their own way. So the way it all started was uh, I moved back to St. Louis and my YouTube manager, Charlie Marlowe, he called me up. We had each other's phone number and, you know, I'm working for Fox, like all around the America. So when I came back to St. Louis, all the TV and all the media, they, they, they hit me up. They're like, man, you did what we want to do. You, you were, you were like, you know, with Fox, you know? And my friends at Fox downtown, you know, for Channel 2 News, uh, they became friends because they looked at me as like national, you know, like we're going to turn the TV yeah. on. You're going to be on national TV. And, and I, you know, I was the racer out of St. Louis. So Charlie Marlowe said, hey, I'm going to quit Channel 2. He worked in the sports department. He was a, you know, on broadcast. And he said, he said, let me start you a YouTube channel. There so all, all this was Charlie. And oh. I, I split my earnings with him 50-50. And what caught my ear is I said, Charlie, I don't want to do this. And I didn't do it. And about a month later, he called me up and he goes, look, just give me that thing you do in the morning. And all of a sudden, Christmas come around and my daughters gave me this little, uh, you know, like jacket because it's cool in the mornings. It said coffee with Kenny. My daughters named it. I love it. So by accident, everything happened. And, you know, I look back at it and I said, you know, all the best plans are the ones you don't plan. Coffee with Kenny just morphed into, I turn, and sometimes I don't say anything because I don't have anything on my mind, but it's just like something that grabs me. Mm -hmm. And then, I'll, you know, you could go four days, no coffee with Kenny. And then it was the Kenny Wallace show that started YouTube. Mm -hmm. the Kenny Wallace show was me giving my, raw opinion uh you know and that caught me off guard because i said here's why carl edwards quit and my god that went to eight hundred thousand views and i, wow. and I was i was kind of like holy hell <laughs> you know what whoa what just happened? that's scary that scared me mm -hmm. so um so then all of a sudden it was like can we interview people <laughs> well what are we going to call it so then kenny conversation came about so that's how all three started. Wow. And you have all these shows and you get interesting people to interview. You just had Danica Patrick. You also recently had William Byron. And I thought this conversation was so interesting because y'all did talk about money. You talk about one of those things that people don't talk about. And you talked about driver salaries and being open with each other about what people make and things like that. Do you personally feel like drivers talk to each other about what they make? Do you think it could benefit drivers to say, hey, this is kind of the ballpark where I'm at. This is where you should be at. What do you think about driver salaries and how people discuss them? 
when, when I was in my early stages of racing, you know, in NASCAR, I would see Jimmy Spencer is a, is a real name. I watched Jimmy come in to our uh, Xfinity race shop and he would leave. And I said to Rusty, I said, what, what Spencer want? And he goes, oh, I just want to talk about what I was making. Mm-hmm. So if drivers do not talk to each other, they're doing themselves a disservice. Fully agree. You, you got to know what the going rate is. Um, and when I do Kenny conversation and I ask a hardcore question, you know, I, I try to go, okay, look, William, I'm going to rough you up now, but, but I, I don't mean to be mean, you know, William, the story on the street is that, you know, you're driving for like $150,000 a year from R- Rick Hendrick. Is that true? And he goes, no, that's false. Mm-hmm. Boom. Mm-hmm. We, we just de-bullshitted the complete yeah. NASCAR industry. This NASCAR story was going on for years. Like I felt like it went on year three where all the drivers are driving free and they're, and they're and William Byron's wealthy dad is paying them money. So I had to de-bullshit that. Mm-hmm. It, it's mm-hmm. like, there's no way this kid's winning at the highest level in motorsports and driving mm-hmm. for nothing. I think there's also a fear of who is this and where is this going to go? Because I find that when people don't know me, it's harder to get them to warm up to me. It takes more time. When someone does know me, they'll tell me all of these little details about their lives because they trust where it's going to go and how it's going to be presented, right? And it's just a matter of building that relationship and letting them know, hey, I... I am not here as a threat. If I'm reporting something serious, you will know. Other than that, we're just having conversations. And that allows you to learn things and talk about things and teach people about drivers in a way that they don't currently know. I feel like. Yeah. I want to say this. There's so many advantages to social media. Okay. So to me, it's way more good than it is bad. And, And the good about social media is that, if either one of you ladies uh, are not so sure about something, you know, we can get on social media right now on your show. And, you know, listen, I learned this from uh, Andy Petrie. When Andy Petrie was my car owner, you know, Kenny Schrader was driving, you know, the Skull car and I was driving a square D car. Me and Andy would get in arguments and he would say, well, by God, we'll just de-bullshit this right now. In other, in other words, we're going to do it for end all we're, we're going we're gonna to fix it. And I feel like these drivers now have learned that when, when there's something to be discussed, let's stop it right now. And, and I feel like that's what is good about NASCAR media right now is, you know, you can get that interview. We want to thank you so much for your time, but I do have one last question while we wrap this interview up because it's about media influencers. But I remember back, here I go, back in my day when I first started back in, in the day. NASCAR, <laughs> we'd be out, we would be out good. in the midway and I would literally have business cards and I would hand them out. And it would be like, follow us on Twitter. We do updates here. Follow us on Facebook. It was the birth of social media. We've all seen how social media has completely evolved. You can literally film everything right, right. here. Right here. My so, phone's super yeah. beat up. Look at that. What's your take <laughs> on, you know, we've been talking about too, how these teams too have big social media teams, right? That follow them each and every weekend and they can put together reels and videos. How do you think that's helped the sport? Well, you know, I accidentally found out a lot of information about this. Uh, so TikTok is number one with all the kids for NASCAR. Now the kids you know, and me. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm not, I've never got on TikTok just because I'm exhausted already. Same. I, I only choose, I only choose to do so much. So come to find out TikTok is number one for NASCAR right now. Uh, in other words, when something happens, it goes on TikTok first. There, there's something you, you, if we think we're addicted to social media, they say TikTok is times 10. It, it is. It, it's like it, a you're drug. not kidding. You're not kidding. TikTok is, is rough. I'm on yeah. TikTok all the time. <laughs> yeah. So, so I acknowledge that and I know that, and I know that NASCAR has an extreme amount of people that are, you know, it's like, okay, 
When people come into the racetrack, where do they walk? Now they're measuring their footsteps. When people walk in to Martinsville, where do they go first? And and now we know. Uh, so the whole analytic game of everything we do is, you know, I mean, like Charlie can show me my dashboard. When do people log on? You know, it's, mm-hmm. I know the exact time they log on in the evening. Uh, my group is 40 to 60. Um, so this whole game is a new game. And we're watching uh, Jake Paul. Who is Jake Paul? Oh, this was the first guy on YouTube. He's making millions of dollars with these little cr- trading cards. And uh, now we got this. Now there's full productions. Oh, and yeah. you're, you're, you're watching Cletus McFarlane, who is really a real we wealthy watch guy. All the time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and Cletus, Cletus is really a super wealthy man who made his name be a redneck name because his parents were super wealthy. So he dumbed himself down and put on a show. And you're watching these full scale TV productions and they're making millions of dollars, millions Mm -hmm. off of, you know, the platform YouTube and, and, you know, YouTube's happy to do it. So it's just this whole new world, Monica and Alanis where you either choose to engage in it. You know, what, what, what did they say? You're, you're either connected or you're disconnected. And, uh, it found me cause I love talking and there we uh, go. Me too. I love to hear I'm myself. I, I seek attention. <laughs> I'm all messed up. <laughs> Honestly, I love that. That was such a good answer. <laughs> this has, this has been such a good time. We have yes. one question left that we ask every single person who comes on the show and it is what fuels you. In other words, what motivates you the most? The next thing, I am really excited hey. to go to lunch right now. Uh, I'm going to go. Yeah. To- <laughs> I, 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 and I, I, I promise you, what motivates me is what's next. My brain is already what's next. Where am I going to go to lunch? Um, I got some friend coming into town. My dirt car's ready. I work. I, I'm so sore right now. Yesterday, I washed my dirt car and maintained it. Uh, we're going to the movies tonight. Hey, every so? t- every. every Every Tuesday night, we're movie buffs. I love movies. I learn a lot. I like documentaries. Um, and I would say my newest thing, you, you said what fuels me, my newest thing I've learned from good people, they have told me that I said I was going to quit racing because everybody said, you, you, you know, basically you need to quit racing. You're 60. So I told everybody I was going to quit racing because I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. And I had... <laughs> Don Perdome, Walker Evans, and all these people just come out of their lawn chairs and go, no! Love that. And 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 Clint Eastwood, don't let the old man or old lady in. Don't, you know, if yes. you, you, you seize up. And, and I felt it yesterday because I had not worked really hard. And I woke up this morning, I mean, just bruised and battered. So what fuels me is stay going. Don't yes. have that heart attack, mm-hmm. you know, stay going. So yeah, that's it. A body wow. emotion stays in motion. I like it. Unless acted upon by an external force, which is you letting the old man in. Don't yeah, let the like old the man don't in. Don't let him in. There we go. I like that. I like wow. that. Wow. What a good conversation. Yeah. You might even call it a Kenny conversation. Well, I, I'm going to tell Charlie, hey, steal this from Mike's or Hot, put it on our YouTube. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Love Bye. that. No, thank you so much, Kenny. We really appreciate it. It was so good to talk to you. Yay. I know. <laughs> thank you so much. We loved having you on here. I absolutely adore Kenny and just how you ask him a question and he'll answer like five. And you're just, you learn so much from his answer, right? Today was so fun. Yeah, Kenny Wallace is one of the most entertaining NASCAR personalities. I think everybody can agree on that. We've been talking social media, media influencers. If you're on any sort of platform, of course, not TikTok. He made it clear he's not on there. Um, I am. He, he, he is entertaining. He's got a lot to say. So it was a treat to have him on today. It absolutely was. And I also think it's so cool that... He wanted to do something. He wanted to be a race car driver. He became a race car driver. He had people kind of pushing him to do something else. And then he was like, no, I just want to be a race car driver. And he's still a race car driver who just goes online and talks about stuff. That's cool. 
Yeah, doing the best of both worlds. He likes to talk and he likes to race and he's doing them both. Thank you so much for listening to Mics Are Hot on Racing America. I'm Alanis King. That's Monica Palumbo. We adore you. We will see (laughs) you next time with some other wonderful guest. Bye. (laughs) 